less than 1% of artists are successful living through their passion. And I have the luxury of offering jobs to more than 2,000 artists. From balancing athleticism with artistic expression in college to leading one of the world's most groundbreaking entertainment companies, Daniel's journey reflects a powerful blend of leadership and creativity. Through his story, we'll explore how adaptive leadership and deep respect for creative processes are critical in cultivating spaces where art and performance not only coexist, but thrive spectacularly. If you have a great show, you have a great business. If you don't have a good show, you have no business. So that's what you have to find the sweet spot to make a, a show amazing, but also to make as much money as possible. I'm Dr. Jessica Kriegel, and this is Culture Leaders, where we decode the magic behind the masters of movements to unleash the power of culture. This is the story of Daniel Lamar, a master of a movement to help the arts achieve financial success. You're listening to a Culture Partners production. So I'm going to start the same way that I always start, which is asking you, what is your why? Yeah, you know, my purpose is definitely to create jobs for artists. Uh, I love doing it because it's very tough for an artist. Uh, you know that artists, let, less than 1% of artists are successful living through their passion. And I have mm. the luxury of offering jobs to more than 2,000 artists. And I'm so proud of that. So your book didn't really go into the why that's your why. I mean, did you have artistic parents? What was your childhood? Sometimes it's something to do with that. Is it, did it come to you in adulthood? Why is that your why? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I was one of the few guys that would play for the football team and also play for the theater company at the mm. college level. And, and that was unusual. Normally, you were identified as, as a sport person or as a cultural, artistic person. And when, when you look back to it, that's what Cirque is about. Because Cirque is a little bit of sports with the human performance, and it's a lot with artistic content. So, so I think that's why uh, the mm. background was good for me. So you yourself were an artist at heart as well as an athlete. Yes, yes, I was. Uh, I didn't, you know, continue professionally because, uh, you know, I went to become a business person more. But nevertheless, uh, at heart, uh, I'm an artist. Yes. Yeah. So in order to love this book, though, you don't have to be an artist or an athlete, because what I took away from it was the lessons of leadership, the lessons of culture. And, you know, I read everything that there is to read about culture and business. And I, um, I was learning so much. And I want to ask you about specific nuggets throughout the book, if that's okay, that jumped off the page to me. And I wanted to, if you were there with me as I was reading, I would have said, tell me more about this. And not a lot of people get the opportunity to do that. So the first is around, um, you talked about when you first joined Cirque, your job was to adapt to Cirque's unique culture, not the other way around. That's a very unique perspective for a leader to come in and say, you know, I'm not going to try and get them to get on board with my culture. I need to get on board with their culture. That I think that's pretty unique. Would you agree that that's unique? And, and how do you know when you're supposed to adapt to a culture and when you're supposed to influence the culture? Yeah, that was that was pretty unique because when I before I joined Cirque du Soleil, I was more like a traditional business person and, uh, and, and leading, uh, you know, a TV network was more traditional. And when I joined Cirque, I thought that I was a quick learner and that I will get adapted very, very uh, easily. That was not the case because the culture is here at Cirque is very, very different. And I had to change my approach. I had to change my attitude. And uh, that was the only way for me to survive here. Mm. But now what I see more and more, even if you're the leader of an organization, you have to adapt your style to your employees. You have to observe the trend. 
You know, in today's world, the young employees, they don't want to be directed. They want to be convinced that you have a, a direction, a mission that is very clear. Mm, that's interesting. Well, I think if I had to guess, tell me what you think about this, that a lot of leaders come in and they feel like they have to make their mark on a company and that's largely ego driven or fear based. It's I got to show, prove my worth and I'm going to do that by telling everyone what to do. <laughs> and so that wasn't your approach. I mean, even as you became CEO, it still felt like you were always very respectful to what the employees needed and were driving in terms of culture. Yeah, that was that was key to me because, you know, you cannot come, uh, you know, while there is a rehearsal and dictate to the to the director of the show or to the artist, you should be doing this and that. I think your 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 job is much more to mobilize people. You know, we like to say at Cirque du Soleil that the star is the show which means that we should all keep our ego at the door of this office and when you walk in the studio you have to really convince everybody else that you are there to serve the ultimate artistic content which is the show mm, that's interesting so my parents met when my father was the owner of the Paradis Latin in Paris, which is like a cabaret type show, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like Le Moulin Rouge. And my mother was the artistic director of the Paradis Latin. And they worked together for many years before they ended up being together. Side story that's moderately interesting. They had never dated or kissed or even held hands when my dad knocked on her door and proposed marriage to my mom. Isn't wow. that amazing? It is. Um, but I bring that up to say I've been in this world of performers and artists, and there's a lot of ego for people whose job is to perform, right? I mean, that's kind of the nature. So it's it was interesting for me to see the the emphasis on the lack of ego and the show being the star in a group of people whose whole thing is to get attention at themselves, right? Yeah, no, you, you're right. And, uh, and, and as an artist, our performers, our artists, Obviously, you know, they have this dramatic sense of getting the attention of the public. And, and I, think, I, I think we're open to it. And as a matter of fact, it's part of, of who we are. But at yeah. the same time, it's not because, you know, you're a performer. It's not because you are charismatic that you have to be a prima donna. I, I think that's the nuance here. And that's why we're trying to push we're trying to push people to say, you're an amazing performer, but let's use your artistic contribution to the entire uh, artistic content, which is the show. So can you tell our listeners about the idea of, yes, I will explore that, that you shared towards the beginning of your book, this being a tool in business? Yes, I will explore that. Tell us what you meant, what your tip was there. Yeah, you know, if when you work for an entrepreneur uh, or a visionary, uh, a guy like Guy Liberté, the founder of Cirque, had a thousand ideas per minute. And he would jump in my office all the time saying, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. And, and, and I all, I'm proud to say that I never told him no. I always told him, yes, Guy, I will evaluate it. And, and, and that was because if I would say no, uh, it would have shown that I was not open to his idea. But then I would took the appropriate amount of time to do the analysis of this idea and say, Guy, this is a great idea. It will work. We'll make money. Or this is not a great idea because we would lose money and it won't work. And the good news for me is that he was open to the results of my analysis. So you really did do an analysis on every idea or did you pretend sometimes tell the truth <laughs> obviously there was analysis that were much much quicker than others <laughs> okay so you and then you end the book talking about focus and so that feels like one of the balancing acts from which the book gets its name is yes i will explore that and also we have to stay focused i mean is that one of the 
the tensions that you think is one of your superpowers as a leader, figuring out when to focus, when to broaden your horizons? Yeah, that was that was a really, really thin line. Because on one hand, you have the artists and the creators that think that they never have enough money. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have the business people, the finance people that are telling me that we are spending too much money. So you have to find the right balance. And uh, I, I became to, uh, you know, I've learned to become a, a, a referee here uh, by listening to two sides. And I would, I'd love to organize a meeting with the two sides and understand the arguments. Because I like to say that if you have a great show, you have a great business. If you don't have a good show, you have no business. So that's where you have to find the sweet spot to make a, a show amazing, but also to make as much money as possible. Well, and that speaks to another great tip you had in the book about you like to be able to make a case against your own position. And how do you know when to use that tool, when it's important to make, give us an example maybe of a time when you actually made a case against your position and, and how that helped you? Yeah, uh, you know, I first of all, I like to consult people a lot. So I would like to listen to a ton of people. But at the end of the day, an organization like ours is not a democracy. So someone has to make a decision. So, so I will have a lot of time fueling the debate within a meeting to really listen to all point of views. And, uh, and, and I will never ever hesitate to go through a process that is much more different than my own point of view, because you cannot always trust your own point of view. So that's why I like to debate and to make sure that at the end of the debate, the best idea prevail. It doesn't matter if it comes from me or if it comes from anybody else, but let's have the best idea prevail. How do we get more leaders to understand that their own perspective is not always the golden perspective. That I feel is the thing that hinders progress. Nine out of ten times, nine out of ten times is leaders who just feel right and they're righteous in their rightness. How how did you get there? How did you become aware that maybe your perspective isn't the only? It, it's interesting because for me that was not an option because thinking that you're always right is so so wrong because mm -hmm. I did a ton of mistake in my career and I still do and that's okay as long as you learn from your mistake but 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 you know we like to say here at Cirque that we have 5,000 pair of eyes and ears which means that you can through this amazing network of employees enhance the ultimate solution that you're going to come with so if you're not open, you know, to their creativity, then you're missing the point. Yeah. Okay. So I have a thousand questions. Another one that you you just talked about this adaptability, the ability to adapt being so important. We did research last year with Stanford on understanding what is the best culture and the best culture was an adaptive culture shockingly maybe not shockingly those that were able to shift their culture so not leaning so hard into one way of being but evolving over time is the is the winning formula and one of the debates we were having in our executive team meeting when we were looking at the research is is there a difference between having a bunch of people who have agility mindset, adaptive mindset on a team and a team that has collective unified agility or adaptability. Do you understand what I'm trying to ask? What, yeah. Do, yeah. do you think there's a difference and how do you nurture one versus the other? Yeah, yeah. It, to me, it's very, very different because, you know, if you have all those individuals that are very agile and I would suspect very creative uh, and, 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 and maybe the end result is not that good if they're not cohesive. You right. might have some great individual, uh, you know, people coming with their own idea, but if it's not cohesive, to me, it won't work. 
So that's why I'm trying all the time to mobilize people under an issue and then adapt to the issue. Because, because with, with the new technologies that are happening and that are, you know, totally disruptive uh, on a regular basis now, if you're not able to be agile as an organization, and if you're not able to be cohesive as an organization, you will just not survive. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm glad you said that because that was my position <laughs> in the conversation. So we're aligned. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So um, can you talk about the four criteria? This was another highlights for me. I earmarked that page of the book. Um, you talked about four criteria. Um, what are they and how did you come up with them? Yeah, to, to us, this is fundamental. You know, when we look to a new project, the first criteria is, is there a creative challenge for us? Because we don't want to repeat ourselves all the time. So, so that's the first criteria. The second criteria is the partner with whom we're talking do they share the same values of us? Because we don't want to be with a partner that will be too different of us or will not share the same values. The third one, obviously, is to make profit. We're, 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 we're a private company. And the fourth one is how can we ensure that we and our partner shares our commitment to social responsibility and community involvement. And I can tell you that those four criteria is an amazing guideline to see if you will do good business with your partner or not. You know, when we, th when we went through the four criteria with the Beatles before we did the deals to do a Beatles show, that was very, very interesting because not only do they shared our values, but I think it became a, an incentive for them to do business with us. Mm. I, I've told that part, that story so many times of, you know, I don't need to, I'm not coming in with a pitch. You're creative master, we're creative master. Let's see what happens. And that kind of goodwill in negotiation about let's just see where this takes us. I love that idea. So those four criteria, how did you come up with that? Was that you with a journal on the beach or was it a boardroom conversation? Like where did they emerge from? Yeah, that was that was a kind of, of debate that I was referring to before, which is we, we came together and we said, look, we have to agree on some criteria that whomever is negotiating a deal with a partner, make sure that those criteria are respected by our potential partner. And uh, I have to tell you, that was a very, very interesting exercise because then again, uh, all of us, as we grew uh, behind those criteria, and it has become also, and now we're another way to strengthen the uh, internal relationship between us. So do you think those are universal criteria for businesses generally or, does each business need to create their own? Yeah, I think each company has to create their own, but they have to start the conversation before they put the criteria on the table. They have to all agree on what are the values of the company because those criteria should be meeting their values. Yeah. So there's another amazing point you hit this is why i love this book because it was the, the storytelling was fascinating i'm not even particularly into the beatles i'm sure there's a lot of people who love it because they're into the beatles and the stories of you actually meeting paul and george and ringo were incredible um but also you had so many like just very specific actionable solutions tools and tips and tricks that were in there there's another one about um, crisis management and three points that you had around how to deal with crisis, which had to happen a couple times. Can you share those three points for the listeners? Yeah, I had the opportunity to work uh, in the past in a very important crisis. And what I've learned is the first thing to do is you have to have one leader. 
only one decision maker. Because when there is a crisis, there are a lot of people that wanted to be involved and wanted to position themselves as the savior of the company. But it doesn't work. You just have to have one decision maker, a leader that will take the decision. You have to understand the magnitude of the crisis because sometimes we overreact and that's a big mistake. Or sometimes we don't react enough or not quickly enough. So you have to be able in a very quick period of time to assess the magnitude of the crisis. And, and, and then you have for the moment of the crisis to forget all the financial short-term impact on your company. So you have to, to really focus on solving the crisis. We know it will have a bad impact on the financial, but that's not where the focus should be. The focus should be on resolving the crisis. It's a hard decision to make in the moment, especially when emotions are high, I'm sure. Yeah, no, it is. And that's why you have to remain very calm and very focused and avoid all the noises uh, that you have around of you because during a crisis, there are a ton of noises from the media, from the public, from your employees. You have to remain very calm and focused. Yeah. It's like they say when there's an accident that, you know, I was doing the uh, first aid training and the first thing they said is, don't just shout out, call 911. <laughs> Identify the person, point at them and say, you call 911. Make <laughs> someone responsible for it. Otherwise, it just becomes chaos. Um, so you also talk about the power of emotion and pushing deals forward. How, I mean, it's an interesting idea because in business, you hear a lot of people say it's not personal, it's business, it's don't get emotional, it's just a transaction. How do you know when to be emotional and when not to be? First and foremost, being emotional is not a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. You know, you are allowed to be a sensitive person. And, and, and when something happens, when there is a crisis that touch one of your employees of one of your show, you cannot go there with a totally, uh, you know, corporate speech because that's the last thing that the employees want to hear about. They want to understand and see by your body language that you, you, you show empathy, you show sensitivity, and you will focus on the human portion of what's going on than the corporate portion. And, and my view, and I've been quite emotional when we went through some you know, tough situation, and I think I gained credibility. I didn't lose credibility. Yeah, I mean, my favorite part of your book is you start the book with saying, you may be wondering why you wanna take business advice from a guy whose company is bankrupt, and here's why. <laughs> It was so refreshing, you know, it was just so wonderful. And then the journey is, that's the whole point is, uh, you said this earlier today that we all make mistakes and, you know, arguably you made them, you didn't necessarily, COVID wasn't a mistake you made, right? I'm sure you do tell the story of mistakes that were made, but ultimately it's just a journey that we're on and it's all about how you react in that journey. Yeah, no, totally. And, uh, and, and interestingly enough, this book was ready to go and I was about to publish the book right in the middle of the COVID. And then I called the publisher. I said, I cannot publish a book. I look, I would look very, very stupid. And the publisher says, of course, Danielle, you're right. We cannot do that. But if you keep writing, maybe at the end of the COVID, if you emerge, then maybe the book will be more interesting. And I think that was the right decision at the time. Oh, yeah, it was great. So compelling. And so I'm curious what you're doing now. You're no longer CEO. Are you chairman of the board? Is that it? Yeah, I'm executive uh, vice chairman of the board. Uh, my job is, uh, is to continue the relationship with our key partners like uh, MGM and uh, Disney and a lot of promoters. And uh, now that uh, my friend Stefan is the CEO, I'm supporting him. But more interestingly, I'm doing what I love to do, which is business development. So I'm working on some amazing new shows that will be presented uh, around the world in uh, the coming little uh, few years. Are any cre artistic 
partnerships that you can really tell us reveal here or do we have to wait and find out <laughs> no i think uh, i think our next show in uh, nuevo vallarta uh, is going to be probably one of our next statement uh, it's going to be presented at the vitenta resort it's a, it's a dinner yeah. show it's a dinner show but in a very very special uh, theater that is uh, being built for us and I'm very excited about that project. Okay, that's exciting. I'm excited for it too. So um, you told this great story about George Martin and, and getting to a deadlock with the Beatles and whenever being in a deadlock, finding a creative way out. Are there other stories you can share with us in your experience about being in a deadlock and finding that creative way out and how you go about doing it? Yeah. A you know, we had the opportunity uh, to replace our show La Nuba at Disney uh, in uh, Orlando. And, and then they came with this. They said, look, uh, if you want to keep the theater, you have to come up with a show idea that will be including the intellectual property of Disney. And there was a lot of turmoil internally because everybody was saying, you know, I don't want to see a show with uh, Mickey Mouse being an acrobat or, you know, <laughs> people were debating internally. And, uh, and, and, and then one creator says, uh, you know, let me come back with, with something. And he came with this clever idea because what is the most touching par part of Disney even today is that they almost invented uh, animation movie. And so the guy came with this idea saying, we've paid a tribute to the Beatles. Why can we not pay a tribute to Disney animation? And, 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 and then all the controversy there was about this idea became very, very positive because everybody admire, uh, you know, the Disney animation. And uh, it, 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 it went from being a very negative uh, artistic challenge to become a very, very positive artistic challenge. And now we have a great show in Orlando and we're proud of it. Wow, that's wonderful. I just heard a great story about Disney and that Walt Disney had imagined creating this park, right? before it started with animation and then he had this vision for a park and apparently he died before it was complete and once it was complete they were standing there looking at it with Walt's brother what was his brother's name Roy or something Roy, like that Roy, yeah, yeah Roy yeah. and Roy someone looked at Roy and said oh man you know can you believe what Walt would think if he could see this and Roy said, what are you talking about? He did see it. That's why it's here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that story. I mean, mm -hmm. it feels like you are that that visionary, but also that was able to operationalize as a CEO. Was it hard for you to step away from the CEO role? No, that was, first of all, that was my decision. I thought it was time to have someone that will come with new new ideas that will be stimulated to lead the company for many years to come. And uh, the reward for me is that the board wanted me to stay here, uh, which is great and fun, but I'm so fulfilled with those new shows that uh, uh, were developing that I don't regret one ounce of that decision. Well, I'm so glad to hear that. So we have a caller who has dialed in and, and has a question for you. I can't keep you all to myself on this episode. So let's take that caller and see what they have for you. Yep. Hi, Daniel. What was the most challenging period that you can remember in your career? And how did you overcome it? What was the context? And do you ever feel echoes of that same kind of circumstance come back to your life? And, and how do you recollect on it now? Thank you. Obviously, there is there is nothing comparable to the COVID. The COVID was a huge disaster. Within 48 hours, we moved from one billion of revenue to zero revenue, from 5,000 employees to no employees. And uh, and there is a couple of things that we did right. First is to stay in touch with our consumers by creating Circ Connect and having 70 million viewers, uh, you know, being part of that. And, and that demonstration by itself 
was what convinced the bankers and the new investors to support us. Because just imagine the meeting for a moment. You're looking to someone saying, I have no more shows, no more revenues, and I need $350 million to relaunch the company. So that was my pitch. So the only way I've been able to convince the people to continue to support us financially is by showing them that people, 70 million people from around the world were waiting for Cirque to reopen. You told the story in your book about how surprised you were about the performers staying in shape and rigging contraptions in their living rooms and their backyards and how quickly they were able to get back into it when they got back. I mean, tell us about that. That was an incredible story. Yeah, that was, that was rewarding to us because what we did is, you know, remember at the time, they were no longer our employees legally, but we have to continue to communicate with them as if they were our employees. And the key message every month where we had our monthly with them was, we're not going to be able to relaunch the company if you're not in shape. And they've been very, very creative. You know, as you said, training in their basement and in their garage and, 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 and performing that people thought that it will take six months to reopen one show. We have reopened 30 shows within one year. Wow. I mean, that was incredible. And it speaks to the culture that you had, the commitment, the passion, the vision that they were all bought into. And I, I believe that brand and culture are two sides of the same coin. Brand is the external manifestation of your culture and culture, the internal manifestation of your brand. So you had these 70 million viewers, but also the commitment from your employees, because it's like you can't keep them apart. The audience members and the performers, they want to be in love and together. Your job is just to make sure they can financially. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And that was the main reason of uh our relaunch uh, so quickly. Well, I have one last question for you, which is what is one thing that you don't get asked about very often or ever on these types of interviews that you really wish more people would ask? Yeah, it's about our uh, community involvement. Um, hmm. You know, because, because when people ask me, what are you the most proud of? Uh, is it that you're selling 13 million tickets a year? Is it the quality of your show? Is it uh, that you're a creative powerhouse? I'm proud of all of that. But the one thing I'm the most proud of is our social involvement. Our studio are built in the poorest neighborhood in Montreal. We are involved with the One Drop Foundation. We are helping youth at risk. And to me, it gives a purpose for the organization. But not only are we making money, but with the money we're making, we're able to our level to bring a contribution that will hope will help change a portion of the world. They, they can go to uh, my uh, website and uh, they could also, uh, as, you, as you invite uh, so nicely, them to go on Amazon to get, uh, to get my book. Thank you. Thank you to you. I do appreciate your time too. Thank you for tuning in to Culture Leaders. I'm Dr. Jessica Kriegel, hoping you found inspiration in today's story. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a review and share your thoughts. And thanks for listening. To connect and learn more about today's guest, visit the link section on this episode's show notes. Please be sure to connect with Jessica and the show at jessicakriegel.com. There, you'll be able to see all the episodes and learn more about transforming culture at your organization. This episode is a Culture Partners production. Until next time, keep shaping a positive culture. Thanks for listening.